afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Staffordshire Chambers Commerce Business Festival. For those of you that are just joining us, we can see and hear you today, but if you want to take your cameras off or mute yourself, that's absolutely fine as well. Uh, this afternoon's webinar is Future of the Office, just a workspace or a hub for collaboration and innovation. And I'm delighted to have with me today, Nick Gostick, Director of the Smart Innovation Hub and Head of the Keel Science and Innovation Park, and Emma Bonfilio, uh, Research and Innovation Advisor. Um, so just so you know, um, you can pop in the chat should you want to um, listen to the webinar, um, make any questions for the webinar um, for Nick and Emma today. Um, and like I said, there will be answering any questions that you've got after the webinar as well. Uh, Nick, it's over to you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, welcome to this webinar and uh, also welcome to those that will be uh, that are catching up as uh, as I often like to catch up on webinars uh, that, that uh, frequently clash my very, very busy diary. So I'm just going to um, share my screen. Uh, you just give me a moment. Can I just get a thumbs up to confirm that that's uh, that's shared? Uh, not at the moment, unless Emma can see it. No, I can't see it. Oh, right. OK. Of course, it worked perfectly before. <laughs> um, so let me try again. I'm sure it. There we go, Nick. We've got it. Perfect. Right. OK. So I managed to miss out a step. OK. You still got that? Yeah. Perfect, Nick. Thank you. Good. Okay. So, um, yeah, working in offices, it's been quite an interesting uh, 18 months, really. So I thought I'd just take a moment and think, where are we now? Well, this is certainly not the new normal that we were promised. I think that the pandemic is still raging. Uh, Brexit is impacting. Um, and many people are still working from home. Um, but many people have gone back to the office as well. So it's uh, it's quite a, a strange period. Um, and of course, many people were never able to leave the office and had to work all the way through. But I think we've learned some things along the way. And um, I think we have seen that most businesses have uh, have seen a fundamental change in the way, way that they do business. Um, and I think one of them is that our use of communication technology Zoom, like this, Teams, webinars, um, Miro, uh, various uh, uh, types of uh, sharing apps and um, environments. Um, and our use of that has leapt forward. Um, I was looking at a paper from late 2019, which was quite interesting because it, it prefigured a lot of the changes that we saw happen, but the timescales were, were much shorter as we had to adapt to to the pandemic. And I think for many people, they actually quite like working from home. It certainly gives you the opportunity to have, save on travel time, the convenience, um, managing family and other obligations. Um, and just for many people, a more pleasant working environment. But also I know that many people don't like working at home. There's too many distractions. Um, you have to dedicate space in your house to your work, uh, separating the the work and, and life balance is, is difficult. And as one of my uh, team keeps pointing out, he's worked out how much extra heating and lighting he's having to pay to work from home. Um, and that's somebody who lives near the university, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't get the travel sa savings. So it hasn't suited everybody. I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a minute. And I think from businesses, we're not yet sure whether it's a, a huge opportunity to cut costs. Um, uh, a, a human resource and productivity conundrum, or perhaps even a fundamental challenge to, to your business model. Uh, you know, particularly for instance, if you're a, a cafe that relies on your, your business lunchtime trade, if people aren't working in offices, uh, it's, it's quite a hit to your, to your business. So I think we still don't know where this is end, end, going to end up, but I thought we'd have some thoughts about what the important considerations are and where we might end up in terms of the office of the future, what we're doing about it at Keele, 
Uh, and then I'll hand over to Emma, who, who will talk about about innovation and the and the, and the role of uh, uh, of the office in that. Um, so very briefly, um, a history of of the office and the evolution of the, of the office. I think um, you know it used to be that everybody had their own little office with a door they could shut and somewhere they could they could. Uh, uh, call their own. Um, I think we saw a move, particularly in the 80s and 90s, to the cubicle, um, where everybody had their own own space separated by um, uh, by uh, boards and panels, but they were noisy and 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 people didn't really have their their own space. I don't think it it, it made for a particularly conducive work environment. And then we got rid of a lot of the panels and moved to a more open plan office the idea being that that we'd all be able to communicate and collaborate and uh share work far more more easily i'm not entirely sure that's that's what happened but i think certainly um my experience with most people had got to the the open plan office before we all um we all left the office and went and, and worked from home so back to the fundamental changes in, 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 business, in business models. I think that fundamental change is more than just using, using digital um, environments. I think there's a whole change in the way we approach work, the data that we use, the, the, um, the way in which meetings can potentially cease to be something that happens at a particular point in time and can be something that actually happens at, at people's convenience with um, teams and, 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 and other collaboration, collaboration tools. And I don't think that, that, it, that we, are, we are there yet, certainly from my team and, and at the university, we're seeing people starting to understand the, the, the capabilities that the online environments offer. But, but still a lot of us are confused and, and actually can never find messages because I can't remember whether it was sent to me in Teams, on social media, or in fact was an actual email. So finding anything these days is, 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 is a bit of a pain. Um, I've mentioned people like working from home and I, and I, and I think surveys indicate that, that a lot of people are very keen on the future of work which is agile and I, and I think whilst some people always had the option of working at home I think the big change now is that whereas uh, senior people in an organisation could with a clear conscience work, work from home I always felt that the more junior you were in the organisation the more working from home was somehow seen as, um, as uh, slacking off and, and frowned on and, and you were under pressure to be in the office and see in the office. So maybe that has, has changed. I think consistently the surveys I see tend to indicate about a quarter of people actually want to work from home completely and never go back in the office. About a quarter of people like to, would prefer to work in an office and not work from home. But the majority of people, um, about just over half, tend to be happy with a, a future that's going to be agile. And we'll spend time working at home and we'll spend some time working at uh, working in the office. But I'm always mindful that it doesn't suit everybody. People that don't have good Internet access or people have kids milling around in the background or, or pets or people who haven't got the space at home because of their particular living arrangement. And that might particularly be for young people who can't dedicate a whole room in their, their house to 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 working. Um, and again, back to businesses, I don't think most businesses have worked it out. Some large IT companies seem to have taken the quite drastic decision that they're just going to have all their staff working from home and shut all their, their corporate HQs, which they think will save them a great deal of money. Um, but maybe they'll regret acting so precipitately because I think there's things about working together and the proximity to colleagues which are important, if not all the time, at, at least some of the time. So the future office, I think we're looking at something that's flexible, agile, with activity-based workspaces. And I, and I think there's four types of activities that we're gonna to need to, 
to do in the office or that we do in the office. And, and it may be that different workspaces will be appropriate for different sorts of activity. Um, administration, the paperwork, the process, the routine, the stuff that you don't need to think about too much. That works at home quite well because you, you're uninterrupted, you can concentrate and it doesn't involve other people. So you can do it when you when when it's convenient, whether that's early in the morning or, or uh, in the evening. A space to concentrate when we've got to do some really focused work on a, on a project, we need uninterrupted individual work. And again, working from home suits some people if you've got a, um, a, a quiet workspace at home, but it may be you need to find that in the office. But I think for a lot of people that quite focused work um, is best done at home. A space to collaborate, um, working with others in formal informal meeting spaces, this is going to be important. Um, I think we can collaborate on teams. We can collaborate um, on uh, on on various other um, video conferencing plat platforms. Um, and some people are quite happy doing that. But increasingly, I hear people saying that actually, I'd like from time to time to have face-to-face -face meetings. So you can you can uh, get to know the people that you're working with and and, and make for better meetings. And I certainly think a space for innovation, um, to capture invention, to network, to exchange knowledge and be inspired by ideas. It needs a sense of place. It needs, a, it needs to be an activity that you, you do with others. There's quite a lot of research that shows in, invention and innovation is actually a, a team activity, not an individual activity. And, and that sparking of ideas, I certainly miss and look forward to, to, to getting back to. So what will the office of the future look like that, that, can in, that can incorporate spaces where maybe people can get the focused and interrupted time they need if they want to work on a project and can't work at home, but also spaces that fosters collaboration and interaction and, and social interaction. And maybe our offices will start to look a bit more like our, like our homes. There is a, is a trend to create, recreate some of the more comfortable space that people have got used to working in um and 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 you know maybe the 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 office of the future won't be the the single square uh, or rectangular desk um of a particular size and and perhaps the equipment we're now used to using the laptop the the ipad lends itself to smaller desks and more flexible workspaces But I think more than providing just a space to work, uh, I think the office of the future needs to foster a sense of place, a space for social interaction, to build up social capital, to build up trust, which is a really important, important part of and valuable part of any business, to build up team spirit, and importantly, to generate the culture that, that drives many businesses. It's a, it's a bit of an old adage that, that, that culture trumps strategy um, in, in any business. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's true, but certainly I can see that, that companies with strong cultures really can, can perform particularly well and engage, engage with their, their people. The office may well need to actually encourage back people back into the office. If you want your, your workforce to meet and collaborate from time to time, Perhaps they need a, a reason to be back in the office. And so it needs to be a space that's a destination and experience, not just a desk um, and a place to plug in the, in, in the laptop. And so I think we'll see the further rise of the open plan, the shared workspace. We're certainly seeing with, 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 with colleagues at the university a move to depersonalized offices, which, which encourage hot desking so that people can, um, be more flexible, can just drop into the, when they're working there, can just drop onto any desk, not have their own desk with a, with a broken mug full of pens on, on one corner and, uh, and, a, and a pile of um, yet to be filed paperwork on the other. Um, but is that actually going to foster collaboration? And, 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 and there's been quite a, a bit of work, um, there's a, quite a good paper in, in Harvard Business Review, which looked at this issue of actually what sort of architecture and office design does foster 
collaboration and, and, and support collaboration. And the problem with these open plan shared workspaces is actually they can be um, very different sort of spaces. And the two extremes I've described as the library and the coffee shop. And I, and I think the library is a space where people expect quiet. A lot of people are doing the focused work I talked about earlier um, and needing the, the quiet and the peace and, and don't want to be interrupted or distracted. So, um, so in, li in, in that library environment, you find that team, team interaction actually goes down substantially as people are uh, nervous or, or, or unwilling to interrupt colleagues or have a conversation in, a, in a, an open plan office where other people have got their head down and working. And certainly I've been in open plan offices where it becomes a library and you feel you're even conscious of the fact you, you, you can't take a telephone call in, 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 at, at your desk. And increasingly, with people having wall-to-wall -wall Zoom meetings, are we going to do that from uh, an open plan plan office? If you're the only person having a meeting and everybody else is listening, is hanging on every word, um, that's not really very conducive to confidentiality um, either. But at the other extreme, there's the the coffee shop, and the coffee shop where there's a natural buzz, there's noise, there's people talking. You know, nobody's embarrassed about having that conversation. But there we see um, a hit to productivity because people find it difficult to do the focused work and each interaction, they, each interruption can cost them 20 minutes before they get, get back to it. So somewhere we need to find a balance between the coffee shop and the, and, and the library where we can, we can work comfortably and work productively. And, uh, and I think in, increasingly um, a company's office will be an asset uh, for your business, but not just to impress um, your clients, um, but it might even be the the, uh, the the somewhere to impress your your people and to inspire the, the people that work for you. And I've suggested here that uh, EX or employee experience is the new UX or user experience. So actually, come and particularly as companies increasingly compete for talent. I think there'll be companies that 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 will find that to get the best talent, they're going to have to to meet their needs. And whether it's I want to be able to work from home and I want to be able to work for a company that I don't live anywhere near because um, because that's that's convenient and increases that increase my opportunity. But also the best talent might say, you know what? If one if one company if companies are only offering me the opportunity to work from home, there's not much to choose between them apart from apart from salary. But they might like to offer an option for a company that that has quite an exciting work environment um, that you can access at least some of the time. And I was I was I was thinking that you know companies they could save a lot of money by having people working from home. And and and, um, but then I thought a bit further about it. I thought, well, actually, when it comes to workspace, uh, the cost of providing office space for people is not that great compared to the cost of people. So, for example, I'll use an example here. If you're paying somewhere somewhere around the average wage, which in the UK is about twenty twenty nine thousand pounds, I think now. Um, so roughly, your payroll cost per head is going to be about three thousand three thousand pounds a month. But compare that to the cost of providing office space for the person to work in. So um, it depends how generous you are in office space. Um, the legal minimum, which is based on, on volume rather than, than, than square feet, is about, um, but it works out at about 50 square feet if you're, uh, if you're, um, uh, um, if, if you're in a normally sized office, which is about five square meters, and, and that's sort of a legal minimum if you if you're really cram, cramming people into your into your space. Generally, I tend to find that that in terms of your actual workspace, about 70 square feet is a is a minimum you're comfortable with. Or put it another way, if you've got a 150 square feet foot office, you can easily fit two desks and two people in there, um, as 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 we do with some of, some of my team. Um, but actually looking across the, the, the average um, space allocation per person, um, it runs at about 200 square feet per person. It does change um, 
during periods of rapid growth, you see that number go down as companies take on staff before they take on more office space. Um, but, but roughly, if we take a, a, you know, about 200 square foot space as being the average, so that would put your per head cost of providing office space at about 400 pounds per square foot. Uh, compared to the 3,000 pounds payroll, you can see it's worth making an investment in the office space to get the most out of your, your much more expensive people. And, and for comparison, I've, I've done a rough estimate of, of what it costs to provide people with their, their computer and, and, and IT, which is the other part of, of creating workspace. And, 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 and clearly that's a, that's a, 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 a lot less. Um, 200 square feet is quite a big area to just have you sat in a, in a desk. But of course, in most companies, you've got um, meeting room space, you've got breakout space, somewhere to have a kettle and to make a cup of coffee. You might have require storage space and you might have, you know, a dark corner that's not really usable. So you so you don't have the most efficient use of, use of space, um, which brings me on to really um, what what we're doing at Kiel and what the what what a solution might be that that meets those those needs very well. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, so at Kiel, we have um, a science and innovation park. Um, some of the buildings go back to the sort of late eighties when the when the park was first initiated, and we developed it steadily over the over the years. Um, accelerating more, more, more recently. We have a series of innovation centres numbered one to uh, six. Uh, we are just now building seven and we're just not about to complete eight. We got a little bit out of order um, in, in terms of numbering. Um, we've got a couple of other buildings as well, which are dedicated to specific companies. Um, and they're a mix of uh, office space, and laboratory space. Um, I'm sure many many of you know that the um, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is actually manufactured on, on site by one of our tenants, Cobra Biologics. Uh, we've got a couple of other healthcare companies and a mix of other, other sorts, of, sorts of businesses. Um, our newest completed building is um, is the Denny's Coates Foundation building, which incorporates both Keele University Business School and um, Innovation Centre 6. And we've tried to create space here, which, which fulfills the needs that, that I mentioned earlier, that is agile, flexible, and activity focused. And in terms of, of um, agility, we, we have, um, a number of different types of spaces from the large atrium which is pictured in the bottom right corner here where we've got a cafe where you can have meetings informal meetings we've got some booths where you can where you can do team meetings or or get something like the uninterrupted space that you might might need um, and and we've got meeting rooms so that you can you can uh, book meeting rooms of various sizes from larger boardrooms to a large lecture theatre to small one, two, three people meeting rooms. So there's a degree of flexible space. And in terms of office space, we've got co-working space that people can use where they have a shared office space to a range of, of office sizes where companies can take their own, op can take their, their own op office space. So very agile, um, very flexible and in terms of the types of space that we have but also flexibility because I think in increasingly uncertain business times companies are finding that that they're changing size size quite quickly and committing to a particular sized office might leave them uh, over capacity or indeed under under capacity particularly where we don't quite know what the demand for office space is because staff may work from home or not. You might replace somebody who works from home with somebody that prefers to work in the office. You may find that during periods, particular projects require people to be in the office. So that degree of flexibility is, is, is built into having um, 
more flexible leases with shorter notice terms. And, and we're not alone in offering a uh, very flexible office space. The flex office phenomenon is growing. It does represent about 10, 15% of the office market now with companies like Regis and WeWork very much leading the way. Um, but I think what we have is, is somewhat unique because we're part of a, of a campus, university campus and have a specific focus on innovation, which uh, Emma will talk about a bit more about. Um, we've also got more traditional office, so the, 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 the top right office there, which is Innovation Center 5, is big office spaces where companies take a substantial unit um, at a time, and a number of larger companies are, are, are located in, in that building. And um, the office on the left hand side, um, I have to say isn't real, it's computer generated, but it's quite a good one this one. Um, but it's a building that, that exists now as a, as a metal frame, so we are building it. I think the floors are in, um, last time I, I, I was there. And this will be Innovation Centre 7. And again, we're starting not just to look at the flexibility of office space that we have in IC6 with, with a number of different types of workspaces which can, uh, which can accommodate different types of activities from collaboration to, to more focused working, but also a, a space which has um, a particular focus on AI, digital um, and data visualization. And the building has got loads of screens throughout it um, to allow data visualization, but it'll also help to have more um, blended meetings. And I think that's the next thing we've got to get to grips with, where some of the people are present and some of the people are, are online and finding a way to have those meetings in a way which is fair and doesn't discriminate against those people that choose to be uh, joining a, meet, a meeting remotely. And I think that's going to be an interesting interesting challenge for us as well. So I think that's uh, a, a quite a, a gamble, gamble through, but um, I think uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. And, and really just to summarize, I, I, I think it's an interesting time. We're not in the new normal, but I think we've got an idea what the new normal might be like. And I think we've got an idea that the office of the future will, be, will have to accommodate different types of working. And that may be in different, different workspaces. So maybe the idea of a single workspace where you normally work will be changed by a series of workspaces where you feel comfortable um, tackling different types of, of work. And a particular importance is how we, we build back into our working lives, the collaboration, the team working, the social interaction, the trust building, which I and many of my colleagues miss from, from the pre-pandemic pandemic time and do that in a way that, that, that doesn't um, discriminate against people that are working from home or prefer to work from home, that still accommodates any lingering um, social distancing that we might, might require to build into, into our working, working lives. And finally, and, and, and it would be remiss of me not to mention it, we do have to think about the sustainability of the office of the future because having essentially two office spaces for people, both home and, and away, may get uh, quite expensive in terms of, of, of energy use. And, and just as my colleague who said, look, it's costing me more to, to work from home and have the heating on all day and the lighting on during the winter, um, when we're, we're, we're fully adopting agile working, it also means our offices are heating and lit as well. So in terms of sustainability, that might have impacts to companies, companies as well. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to, to Emma, who's going to give a little bit more detail about innovation and really the, the higher order value that we can build into the, the office of the future by utilizing the, the, the place and particularly the, the place that's, uh, that's also a university campus. So Emma. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna try and share my screen now.
and let me know if that's worked. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, because you, you've all slightly disappeared, so I'm guessing something's happened in the <laughs> background. Okay, so hello everyone, and I'm going to take the next part of this talk. And what I want to discuss is the the value of innovation and collaboration within businesses in the area and how that relates back to the idea of workspace and how we at Keel think that that's related around the idea of community and being part of, of something bigger than your own organisation. And throughout this, I'm going to give regular examples about businesses that we've been working with and businesses that we've engaged with. And those examples come primarily from our research and innovation support network and a programs, uh, some ideas from our network from in curricular activity with the business school. Um, but I won't be mentioning any companies, I'm just letting you know that all of those are real examples. And I will try not to romanticize it too much because I am very much a fan of being in a building and in a place of work. And when Nick talks about hot desking, I'm the person that's still got all of the personalized stuff around my office. And I absolutely love being there and being part of that community. And then I've got a very empty desk next to me for my colleague that really thrives working from home. And I've got three notepads on the desk. So it's, you know, it's a very different sides of the office. OK, so this first slide is about what we think the value of innovation is. And it relates to the experiences that we have had working with businesses during the last 18 months. And I do want to caveat that, like Nick has mentioned previously, we're still in an incredibly reactive situation. And some of this is going to seem quite anecdotal. And I think that's because it is right now. Um, but it is first hand experience from working with our businesses. So when the lockdown first hit, we had expected an innovation activity to fall and that the priority for the businesses that we were working with to be focused on survival and keeping core business functions running not only in the businesses we're working with, but in our business itself, because of course the business and the business model of the university fell immediately through the first lockdown and we all had to make changes in delivery. Um, but actually what we found was that yes, initially that need for innovation did fall for about a microsecond. And then very quickly businesses were engaging in acts of innovation and responding to a completely unprecedented change of environment and service delivery. So we've seen businesses, most businesses that we work with have seen a massive fundamental change in how they operate and how they deliver their services. And they've had to completely change what they deliver, how they deliver, and either pivot um, and change direction within their own market and offer a new service, or offer the service that they did before, but in a completely new market, driven by new market drivers in a different area that they've not previously considered. Okay. So we've also seen that um, people have innovated in their delivery process. And that although there's been a lot of change, that the networks that we've held from the beginning, not only have remained invaluable, but the reliance on those networks have stayed in place completely. And that might be for shared problem solving, um, a share of experiences or just acting as a soundboard or a way to call out to other people as everybody's going through the same situation. So although there's been lots of changes, that network effect has absolutely not changed and that has remained as relevant as it did before. We've also seen a huge rise in purpose-driven businesses. People taking, um, jumping into businesses from opportunities they've seen to make things better around them and purpose driven in that those companies are moving beyond the commercial intent to engage and play a role in society through social value, social responsibility and active sustainability and where they fit as a business in that place that, that they are in the place that they do business within their own community. Change. There we go. So, what does that mean for as we return? And I use the word return and normal very loosely in this situation because I'm not entirely sure we are returning and I'm not really sure what the new normal is or the old normal. So, so what we've seen is businesses have had an opportunity to innovate old practices 
for many businesses, the break that they had in that first lockdown allowed for a moment of pause and reflection about what happened per what happened previously and let them have a real think about how they could improve that service. There's also been an opportunity to assess the, the in-person and online delivery to maximise benefits to their clients. An example of this is a company that we worked with that had great success moving all of their services online straight away as they went into the um, into home working so they could continue making money and they felt that some of that practice should continue if business was to return back to normal because not only did it allow increased flexibility for both clients and the people working for the businesses but it also was a chance to expand geographically and this was something that wasn't possible previously and it wasn't something that they were expecting so this was a really good time for that company to look at both the affordances that was offered by online working and how they could move that forward, but also the constraints and the limitations of that service offering, things that actually will probably need to move back in person or at least partly in person to ensure the client gets the maximum benefit. And now that's a brand new mix that was never expected. And what does their service portfolio look like going forward at this time? We've also seen that the spaces that businesses work in need to be really dynamic, flexible, and purpose driven. So sometimes the need for workspaces and social spaces change and it can change in any given week. And sometimes the traditional office building where everything's in one place doesn't quite fit the bill anymore. And I know Nick's already said a lot about that so I'm not going to labour too much on that point. But an example of that is a business that I've been working with and they've all been home working and at a point where they needed to interview for staff they wanted to come into the building and interview in our building in a place that's not quite so personal to them in their own personal lives. And this is an example of them just needing a bit of space that is business related and business focused and just allows them to talk to people about business matters. And we also need space that allows for the increase and reduction of people depending on the size of the business. As we return back to office working or we try and maintain an element of home working, we're all in a state of flux and it's going to take us all a little bit of time to figure out what that configuration looks like and what it looks like in different periods of time as we go through the year. And then we also need space that allows for businesses to grow as and when they need. Okay, so we've got workspace as a tool. You've seen a very similar slide from Nick, but what I want to do is focus on the community element of that. So as I said previously, needs vary in working environments. Sometimes an office is exactly what you need. Sometimes you need that space, you need the time to be creative, you need silence. Sometimes you need a meeting room where you can greet visitors, where you can recruit new members of staff, where you can just work around a large table. I mean, I love working around a really big table with a big piece of paper and lots of colour pens. That's really great, but it's not necessary all the time. So, and you also need space where you can collaborate, work with people um, and make different types of decisions or work collaboratively with the people, both inside and outside of your organisation. Also access to mentoring and ad hoc support that can help you with both the hygiene factors of the business that just help the day day running, but also the strategic decision making. And that can be people, so from within the university, we're housed with the business school. And as you would expect, there are lots of people within the business school that know about many different business practices, such as exporting, internationalization, growth, um, different type of monetization, finance models. And it's being able to pull that expertise that I think has been really valuable for the people that we've been working with. Not only that, but the access to peer groups and being part of a community, people who are at the same stage of you and the same size, but also earlier and older and bigger and smaller. It gives you a whole group of people to mix with that being part of that community allows you not only to reach out for areas of expertise that you might need, but also contribute your own experiences um, and expertise to a situation. Okay, so making a space for innovation. Now we wouldn't be a university if I didn't throw at least one academic model at you, but bear with me, I'm genuinely going somewhere with it. So this is the triple helix model of innovation. And it was proposed in the 1990s. 
and that shows the interaction between three entities, the university, industry and government. And it's used widely in academic studies to show the holistic environment of innovation and moving away from the more linear models that we had previously. And what this model does is it demonstrates the benefits for each, um, sorry, demonstrates the benefits for each stakeholder within that model with a focal entity in the middle. And I think that's innovation and collaboration sit right in the sweet spot in the middle of that helix. And that's quite a brief and very superficial um, summary to what the triple helix model is. But it's been used a lot within public policy. And the reason I picked this model is because I think at Keel, not think, I'm very sure that at the Keel, we have not only picked up this model, but we've expanded on it to provide both regional economic growth and innovation and enhance the activities that go on with the university itself. So we've moved well beyond that scope, beyond that scope into something that's a lot bigger than the original helix. And I, I don't know whether to, what to call it. It's not a triple helix anymore. It's more like an interpol helix because I couldn't fit all of the elements on the slide. So I might have only added, is it eight? I might have only added eight circles, but I could go all day and we could just do, we could keep going around with this. But the point that I want to make is that we've created a space that not only provides businesses with the access to the university, but the student talent and the workforce of the future that we're working with, the academic expertise, and then people that, people that sit within my team that have that experience, both operationally and strategically within business. We also have great networks with other government funding. We know a lot of the other teams that sit around us offering support, both um, business assist or um, funding, marketing, or big strategic um, projects that are going on in both our area and a little bit wider, so we can create those links for people. And then industry, we've created a multi-stakeholder situation where businesses can work and network and be part of that community, working with students and academics, both in curricula and out of curricula on research projects um, that we do regularly within Smart Innovation Hub, but not only that, but recruiting our graduates and being a part of the university curriculum. And what I mean by that is having a voice in how we educate the workforce of the future and how we get them prepared to well, essentially be part of your businesses going forward. So we know, and, and Nick said, again, Nick said this previously, that innovation is a community act and it's centered around collaboration. And whilst the idea is the currency that you start with, it's all of those micro actions as part of a community that push it forward. And what we've done at Keel is create an environment where you have that resource, both physically um, and in terms of people and talent, that you can keep moving with that idea. So to give some examples of this working, so we have um, quite a lot of businesses in the hub now. I don't know exactly how many, Nick, you might. I think um, it's about 20, I think. About 20, yeah. yeah. So I regularly catch up with the businesses on both a formal and informal basis. And I often hear that, you know, they've met one of the other tenants and they're now working together on a funding bid or they're working together on a new idea or they had coffee and actually they realised that they were struggling with the very same thing and they want to approach an organisation or the university together to find a solution to that. I've seen students walk into businesses and create their own placements and then create their own full time jobs after that placement just by virtue of being in the same place. So there are lots of examples and I'm, I'll try not to give too many because I really don't want to romanticise this anymore. So we move back and I don't, Nick, you might want to pitch in with this bit, but the last few slides are really just to again uh, reinforce and elaborate on what the Smart Innovation Hub, also known as the Denise Coates Foundation Building, can offer to a business. So we've got multiple different types of space that can suit the needs of all businesses. We have the use of meeting rooms, um, lecture space, exhibition space. There's the atrium that's very popular and I, I love walking around and having a coffee and just catching up with people while they're on their downtime or they've decided to have a slightly different environment um, for the afternoon. But we also have different programs that run that. So we have a leadership support program, an innovation support program. We have a base camp that works with new enterprises. 
and there's entrepreneurs in residence and a whole team of people that are, well they, they want everyone to win so we're there to help people you know when they've got something that needs a bit of help so and then on top of that the building also offers incubation support again we've got the base camp you've got access to the business school law support clinics networking events uh, incubation acceleration programs that are tailored to each individual company and continuous mentoring on company growth while you're being supported and often after you leave the university Nick, do you want to add anything to that? Have I missed anything there? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to finish off and say that, that the Smart Innovation Hub, the Denny's Coach Foundation building that, uh, that Emma showed you a, a picture of, which is which was a really a, 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 a new type of building for the university and, and, and relatively unique in the, in, in the UK, in that we, we co-located a, a university department, the business school, with one of our innovation centres and created the space where those two could come together. Um, and that, that was, I won't say it was completely unique, I can think of a couple of other examples, but they're, 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 they're quite unique and not quite the same in, 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 in an individual building. But we're very pleased with the results. And even though we only had the building for about four or five months before we got shut down in the, in the, in the pandemic, nevertheless, it, it gave us the confidence to carry on. Um, and we've now just completing our new veterinary school at Kiel, which is built on the same model. It's part veterinary school. It will also have um, companies or commercial uh, activity in the building, um, giving students an opportunity for their, their placements um, on site. And as I showed IC7, Innovation Centre 7, again, will be a mix of university, academic, teaching and research with half the building dedicated to companies that can come in and rent the space and run their business in there. We don't have, we don't require them to interact with the university, but we hope we can, we can give them opportunities to, to work and collaborate with the university, which most of our tenants to actually take up and I think that plays to the theme of, of the workspace of the future being more than just a place to sit and work and actually looking to leverage real value out of it real value for our, our employees and real value for our, our, our businesses by the architecture by the space and, and by the communities that that, that, that that we're located in and I think I, that's about it for me Emma you um yeah, that's that's about it from me as well. So I suppose it only remains to say thank you very much for uh, taking the time to listen to us this afternoon and about our idea of what that community looks like. And of course, if you want to get in touch with us to talk about anything that we've discussed today, you can follow the link that's on this slide. OK, shall I stop sharing now, Laura? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, just want to say a massive thank you uh, to Nick and Emma for today. Um, absolutely fantastic. And, and just a little, just a snippet, I imagine, an eye opener of what's to come in terms of um, making sure that um, we're, we're providing everything we need to for the people around us to work effectively and efficiently as possible. So um, really exciting there. And um, for those of you that didn't see there was a QR code, but we will be adding that QR code to the end of the session as well. And um, if you are watching it on demand and don't forget, we are hosting a, um, a load more uh, webinars tomorrow and Friday um, just to end the business festival week. Once again, I want to thank Nick and Emma and hopefully we look forward to seeing you very shortly. Bye for now. Hey!